Hello, I'm JW. Uh, this is part three in the Earthing and Bonding series, and this time we'll be looking at supplementary equitential bonding. Uh, previously we've looked at the main bonding and, of course, uh, earthing in part one. And if you haven't seen those, then, of course, links will be provided in the usual places. So uh, this is about supplementary equipotential bonding. Now, the principle of this is very similar to the main bonding, but the difference is that rather than dealing with an entire building, you're actually just dealing with a small location, and the location that's most commonly involved is the bathroom. So uh, we'll have a look at that and see what needs to be bonded and what doesn't. So a quick reminder of the definitions which we've seen in the previous part. And so we've got equipotential bonding, which is electrical connection maintaining various exposed and, of course, extraneous conductive parts at substantially the same potential. And uh, the exposed conductive part is the conductive part of equipment. And, of course, the extraneous conductive part is some part that's liable to introduce a potential and is not part of the electrical installation. So for the exposed ones, it's going to be the sort of metal case of a washing machine and uh, any metal parts of electrical equipment. And the extraneous one is something that's not part of the electrical installation, but of course uh, is going to introduce a potential into the area or the building in question. And typically that's going to be things like your gas and water pipes. And the purpose of the equipotential bonding is to ensure that in the event of a fault, the voltage on those two types of part is kept uh, pretty much the same or as close to that as possible. Because what you don't want is uh, a fault to occur and say the exposed conductive part uh, has a voltage on it. And then of course your extraneous part doesn't, so of course you've got a fairly high voltage between the two, therefore providing a shock risk. Now, supplementary equipotential bonding is uh, described here in uh, 4152, uh, and it comes on the heading of additional protection. And note the word additional, it's not the sole means of protection, it's just something that you can add additionally in certain circumstances to provide extra or additional protection. And uh, I've got the various notes here. So, uh, supplementary equipotential bonding is considered as an addition to fault protection. Uh, the use of supplementary bonding does not exclude the need to disconnect the supply for other reasons, so, for example, uh, protection against fire, thermal stresses and equipment, etc. Supplementary bonding may involve the entire installation, and that's what we looked at in the previous episode, a part of the installation, an item of equipment or a location, and that's what we're looking at this time. Uh, location uh, typically is a bathroom, but uh, other locations, of course, may apply. And additional requirements may be necessary for special locations, see the corresponding section of Part 7, or for other reasons. And again, this is where the bathroom comes into that. And a 41521, uh, supplementary equipotential bonding shall include all simultaneously accessible exposed conductive parts of fixed equipment and extraneous conductive parts, including, where practical, the main metallic reinforcement of construction or reinforced concrete. And the equipotential bonding system shall be connected to the protective conductors of all equipment, including those of socket outlets. Now this bit about the concrete is obviously where practicable, because uh, in plenty of cases there won't be any concrete in the actual construction, and even if there is, the uh, metallic reinforcement inside may not be accessible, but uh, if it was, then of course you would uh, connect to that. However, the majority of cases, certainly your sort of average house with a bathroom, that's uh, not going to apply. And finally, on the next page here, we've got 41522, and uh, it says, Where doubt exists regarding the effectiveness of supplementary equipotential bonding, it shall be confirmed that the resistance R between simultaneously accessible exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts fulfils the following condition. And there's two options here, one for AC and the other for DC. And essentially, you want the resistance between those parts uh, to be less than or equal to 50 volts divided by a current, and the current is an amps which is going to cause automatic operation of the protective device. And uh, for RCDs, that of course is going to be the actual tripping current, so that's going to be 30 milliamps. And of course, you can put various uh, currents and things in there and get various results from that. And of course, to test this in the real world, it's simply a question of uh, measuring the resistance between the various exposed and extraneous conductive parts and identifying whether or not it actually uh, fulfills this requirement. The reason it's got 50 volts here is that's generally considered the maximum allowable voltage uh, to appear on those parts in the event of a fault. Uh, 50 volts AC generally is not going to cause any sort of serious injury or death to anybody. And of course the same again for the uh, 120 volts DC, though that's uh, fairly unlikely in a uh, normal domestic situation. Uh, when you get voltages above 50 volts then of course that's the issues where you're going to get uh, dangerous shocks and things uh, being created. So uh, 
generally less than 50 volts is considered acceptable. But of course, if the uh, resistance is very low, then the voltage is actually going to be far less than 50. Of course, the lower, the better. Now, just a couple of examples of uh, the sort of values you're going to get from this. Uh, as it says here, the uh, current there, IA, is uh, for RCDs, it's going to be I delta N, which is the tripping current, so 30 milliamps in the majority of cases. And uh, 50 volts uh, divided by 30 milliamps actually comes out as uh, 1,667 ohms, so that's quite high. However, for example, if it was an overcurrent device, then it's the uh, current kind of corresponding to automatic operation. And say for a 6 amp circuit breaker, that's going to be around 30 amps. And again, 50 divided by the 30, it's actually only 1.6 ohms. So depending on what uh, protective device you have, it makes a huge difference to the uh, allowable value of R there. So with the RCD, of course, it's uh, much higher, meant because the uh, RCD will trip on a far lower current, so 30 milliamps, as compared to uh, 30 amps for, say, a 6 amp circuit breaker. And certainly for bathrooms now, in the majority of cases, they will have an RCD on the circuit anyhow, so it's going to be that higher figure. But of course, uh, nothing wrong with having it considerably lower than that. Now, the section dealing with uh, bathrooms, or in other words, locations containing a bath or shower, is section 701. And uh, there's a whole load of stuff in there about the various uh, different requirements. But the one requiring supplementary potential bonding is this one here, which is 701 and as it says here, local supplementary equipotential bonding according to Regulation 4152, and that's the one we uh, just looked at there, shall be established connecting together the terminals of the protective conductor of each circuit supplying Class 1 and Class 2 equipment to the accessible extraneous conductive parts within a room containing a bath or shower, including the following, and this is just some examples, so metallic pipes supplying services and metallic waste pipes, so water and gas, metallic central heating pipes and air conditioning systems, and three, accessible metallic structural parts of the building. And note here there's a whole list of stuff which is not considered to be extraneous conductive parts, and that includes things like door architraves, window frames, and similar. And uh, here, supplementary potential bonding may be installed outside or inside rooms containing a bath or shower, preferably close to the point of entry of extraneous conductive parts into the room. So this means you don't necessarily have to put it in the bathroom itself, if, say, you had an airing cupboard next to the bathroom and all the sort of water pipes things can into there, then it's perfectly fine to put the bonding in that cupboard. Again, preferably as close as possible to where those pipes actually go through the wall into the bathroom. And in many cases, that's far more convenient because generally in bathrooms, the sections under the bath are generally enclosed, so you can't get at them. And that may also apply to the basin and other fixtures as well. Now, in new installations, it's generally the case that supplementary equitential bonding is not installed in bathrooms or uh, other bathrooms with a bath or shower. And this is because the uh, bonding can actually be omitted if these uh, conditions here are met. All final circuits in the location comply with the requirements for automatic disconnection according to Regulation 41132. Well, that's not exactly hard because they're going to comply with that anyhow. If they didn't, then of course you've got much bigger problems than uh, just dealing with the things in the bathroom. Now, obviously, if they didn't apply with that, uh, you're not going to have the circuit disconnecting when there's a fault or whatever. So that's pretty much uh, always going to be the case. And the second one here, all final circuits of the location have additional protection by means of an RCD in accordance with the regulation there, 701-41133. And notice it's all of the uh, circuits in the location. So, of course, it's going to include the lighting, maybe an electric towel rail on the wall, uh, electric shower, underfloor heating and all that kind of stuff. So providing all of them have RCD protection, that's fine. And then the third item here is that all extraneous conductive parts of the location are effectively connected to the protective equipotential bonding according to Regulation 411312. Again, this is normally going to be the case, although watch out for things such as the metallic pipe coming in and uh, going into the back of the toilet. Of course, that may not be bonded, though it uh, obviously should be. And generally, though, of course, your water and other things will always be bonded anyhow. And the note here is that the effectiveness of the connection of the extraneous conductive parts in the location to the main earthing terminal may be assessed when necessary by the application of Regulation 41522. And uh, 41522 is the one we just saw there with the uh, formula, where essentially it's 50 divided by the uh, current to disconnect in the event of a fault. So that's the uh, 30 milliamps of the RCD, which of course would normally apply because you're going to have that uh, anyhow here. 
or in the event of no RCD, then of course it's the uh, current to cause disconnection. So it's 16, 67 ohms essentially. Again, you can easily measure that in a sort of real world situation. Now let's have a look at bathrooms and some of the items you would find in there and uh, see if they are actually would require bonding or not. Now remembering the uh, definitions before, it's a question of connecting together the exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts. Now any exposed conductive parts will be part of the electrical installation and of course it also stated that uh, any of the protective conductors of circuits in there do need to be included. So that's going to include all of the electrical circuits, so your lighting and say underfloor heating or electric shower, towel rail and so on. And all of the protective conductors in those circuits need to be connected together. Now the extraneous conductive parts uh, is the one that usually causes confusion and bother. And this of course covers things like pipes and other items. So first of all we're going to have the uh, cold and of course the uh, hot pipes coming in there. Assuming you have hot water in your bathroom which uh, you normally would. Now of course pipes can be made of various materials so if they're metallic pipes then certainly they would require bonding. So uh, we'll put uh, metal up there and yes they certainly would require bonding and uh, including with that. Now of course if the pipe is made of plastic, as is quite often the case in uh, newer installation, then of course they do not require bonding. There's no point trying to attach uh, electrical wiring to plastic pipes, that use nothing. Of course they're not extraneous conductive parts because plastic is not conductive, so of course they can't be uh, extraneous conductive anything because uh, say, no conductivity there. So metal pipes of course do, plastic pipes do not. Now I've already mentioned the uh, thing with the, so the toilet waste for example might be a cast iron pipe, and again that would need to be bonded as well because again it's metal coming in from outside the room, and in this case actually outside the building as well. Again they're fairly uncommon on new installations and even say on new ones that may have been refurbished, it's quite often the case that that's replaced with plastic, so again if it's plastic coming in then of course bonding is not required. Now other items included would be your central heating, and of course this would include a radiator or maybe a towel rail or perhaps both. And it really depends on what kind of piping has been used. Now the radiator itself is not an extraneous conductive part because of course the radiator is fully contained within the room and though it's certainly conductive, of course being made of metal, it's not extraneous because say, it's not like it's hanging half out the wall and uh, sticking out into the landing, although uh, I have seen such a similar arrangement in one house but let's not go there. But uh, in general cases of course the radiator is going to be contained within the room so it's not an extraneous conductive part. So I've put in the radiator here, and of course that would include a uh, towel rail as well if you had one of those, basically it's the same thing. Then uh, because it's not extraneous, then of course no bonding is required. However if you have pipes of course connecting to this radiator, which inevitably will, if they're metal, as uh, quite often will be, And of course those are extraneous to the room, obviously coming in from outside of the room, so again they will require bonding. But again as we had before, if they're made of plastic then of course they do not require bonding, obviously because they're not conductive. So I'll just put uh, across there for no. And of course those are all fairly obvious, it's pretty obvious to tell the difference between uh, plastic and metal pipes just by visual inspection. So uh, radiators do not, even though they are conductive, because they're not extraneous. And now this brings us on to another item which uh, quite often causes trouble, which is the bath itself. Now baths of course can be made of a variety of materials. Of course if the bath is plastic, well there's no need to bother with that because again no conductivity there, so it's not a conductive item. And if it's made of metal, then does it need to be bonded? Well the answer is no it does not, because though it's a conductive part, it's not an extraneous part, because the bath is contained completely within the room, it's not sort of wedged half in the wall and uh, sticking into the bedroom next door, and it's certainly not hanging outside into the street. So clearly it's not an extraneous conductive part, it does not require bonding. 
However, of course, the pipes coming into the room, the hot and cold, will go to the bath, and of course those pipes need to be bonded. And the other thing to concern is if the uh, waste pipe to the bath is metal, and if that's, uh, say, metal like a copper or something, then again that certainly would need to be bonded because that pipe is going outside, taking the waste away. But again, on new installations, generally that's going to be plastic, so as with the plastics over here, not necessary. And the last one we're going to fit onto this uh, particular page, as it were, here, is a thing like an electric towel rail. Now, in a similar way to the radiators here, if you've got an electric towel rail, it's not going to be an extraneous conductive part, mainly because, uh, of course, it's not extraneous to the room, though it's certainly conductive. However, a towel rail is, of course, an exposed conductive part. So I'll just put towel rail in here. And we'll put electric, so we we'll change it from the other one. Now, it won't have any pipes connected to it because, of course, it's a self-contained electrical thing that uh, just has a heating element inside. So not extraneous, but this is an exposed conductive part, which, of course, means it's part of the electrical installation. And if the element in the rail was to go wrong, then it's certainly likely that the metal covering of the rail could become live. So, yes, this does need to be bonded. However, it's important to note that uh, it's already going to be bonded anyhow, virtue of its connection to the power supply, because of course the wires coming in will of course have the line neutral and an earth connection in there. So it's already going to be connected there. The only question then is whether the earth wire or protective conductor is actually large enough. And in most cases it will be. We'll have a look at that in a bit more detail shortly. So yes, that does need to be bonded, but again it's going to be part of the electrical circuit anyhow, so you'll probably find that it already is. Now, what about all those other things which uh, people seem to think need bonding, but of course in reality do not? Well, there's a whole list of these, so we'll uh, not go through every single one, otherwise uh, could be here for a while, but the most usual ones are things like this. So we have the uh, kitchen sink, for example. Now, kitchen sinks are often made out of stainless steel, so they're certainly conductive. Now, bearing in mind, this is not in a bathroom anyhow, so uh, it's not actually uh, required, and certainly in a domestic situation. And in the previous editions of the regulations, primarily those ones in the 1980s, unfortunately there was one particular edition came out which essentially said you should bond everything in sight. And uh, fortunately that's now been withdrawn uh, sort of two or three decades ago. Unfortunately, though, there's plenty of people that still remember that, and therefore seem to think that kitchen sinks have to be bonded to everything in sight. Well, that's not correct. Kitchen sinks do not need to be bonded to anything. There's no real reason to do so. They're not part of the electrical installation. They're certainly not an extraneous conductive part because they're fully contained in the room, so bonding is not required there. Though you may find it there because someone uh, either put it in a long time ago or they uh, did their sort of exams about 30 years ago and just didn't bother to keep up to date. But in any case, not required. And along the similar lines, uh, there's a whole load of other stuff which does not need bonding either. And things like metal windows, less common now, but uh, certainly one time they were very common to be made out of aluminium and other substances. Again, not required because certainly aren't part of the electrical installation, and they're not extraneous parts because uh, although they may be sort of fitted on the outside of the building, they're not going to introduce a potential inside because uh, there's just a metallic frame attached in the wall. No real difference from that than touching the wall itself. So they do not require bonding. And there's a whole massive list of this sort of stuff. And you've got sort of things like door handles. And you might think this is very silly, but uh, unfortunately there were people at one time which uh, thought that these were necessarily you have to be bonded to something. Well, of course not. No more than the uh, cutlery in your kitchen cupboard. And uh, this brings us on to the uh, final item we're going to put on here, which are the pipes below your central heating boiler. So we'll uh, just put that in there. Now first of all we can say that pipes to a boiler do not need to be bonded, so let's get that out of the way straight away there. Plenty of people would disagree with this. However, when you actually think about what we're doing, it's ridiculously silly that you would even consider to put bonding in there. Now a modern boiler, particularly if it's a combination boiler, that's the type that heats the water as you require it, has a number of pipes generally all coming out the bottom of the device, and here's a picture of an example. And you've got various pipes there, you've got the sort of cold water coming in from the uh, cold supply, and then your hot water coming out, 
Of course, there's going to be a gas supply going in, and that's obviously going to be in copper pipe as well. And then you've got another couple of pipes there with your central heating, so the hot water comes out and obviously returns to the boiler as well. So you're certainly going to have at least five in there. A lot of boilers also have a uh, metallic other pipe for sort of drainage where the condensate will drain away. So that could mean uh, six of those. And they're generally all metallic and they all connect into the bottom of the boiler there. And plenty of plumbers and other installers of these devices seem to find it necessary to put a whole row of small clamps there and attach uh, some green and yellow wire between all of the pipes in a nice little row. I really can't understand why, but uh, they do it and it's still done to this day and it's actually a fairly common thing to see. Now, this is totally unnecessary for a start because although these pipes might be extraneous to the installation and therefore could be extraneous conductive parts, they actually all go into the boiler just three inches above those pipes there. And of course, where they go into the boiler, they screw through a big chunk of metal. It's generally a huge plate at the bottom where all the pipes go through. And in any case, they're all connected into the boiler somewhere anyhow, which is going to be made of metal. So they're already all connected together literally just a few inches above where those curled bits of wire have been installed. So even if they needed bonding, which they don't, they're already connected together anyhow. So adding some bits of random wire underneath really achieves nothing. Totally unnecessary and very pointless. So boiler pipes do not need bonding, despite what some uh, boiler installers might think. And if you see it there, well, uh, there's absolutely no point to it. You might as well leave it there. Hardly worth the effort to even remove it. I'd say they're all connected together anyway, just a few inches above in the boiler itself. Now here we have an example bathroom, and it has the usual uh, suspects inside. So uh, this side here we've got the uh, basin, of course, for your uh, washing and whatever, and the bath in the middle. And of course both those have the hot and cold pipes coming in, so uh, obviously uh, two taps there and two on the bath as well. And then we've got the toilet over here, and that just has the uh, cold pipe coming in. And then we've got an electric shower over here, and of course that will have a cold supply as well, so we'll uh, just draw that in there. And we'll say it's one of these uh, electric ones that just heats the water as you need it. Of course other types might have the uh, hot and cold going in if it's one of those mixer varieties. And of course the shower itself will also be electrical, so there will be uh, electrical cabling connecting in here, which we're not going to show in this particular diagram. And we've also got a light here hanging down from the ceiling. Again, that will obviously be connected to the electricity supply as well. So your uh, parts that require bonding are the exposed conductive parts, or in other words any of the uh, circuits that come into the bathroom. So in this case it's going to be the lighting circuit, and the circuit for the electric shower, and of course any extraneous conductive parts, and those are going to be the hot and cold pipes coming in over here. Now the hot and cold pipes certainly need to be connected together, and you could do this in a variety of places. Now, the most convenient would probably be here, if there was an airing cupboard outside here, and then you could connect between those with your green and yellow wire and the two clamps. And notice that once you've done it here, it's not necessary to then put a load under the basin here and in the bath as well, because of course all these pipes are metallic, or at least they are in this example. So once they're connected here, of course they're automatically going to be connected here as well and under here. Of course you don't have to put them over there. If you don't want to, you could just put it, say, under the bath in there. And again, if you put it under the bath, you then don't need them under the basin, because they're all part of the same metallic piping system. Copper pipes in particular have a fairly large surface area compared to uh, the actual wiring, so it's actually far larger than the wiring you're going to connect them together with anyhow. And as long as they're electrically continuous throughout, which of course would be the case if they're all copper, then again that's not a problem. And again you could put the wires here if you wanted, the uh, bond between the hot and cold, but then you wouldn't need it under the bath either. So it's really only at one point if the same pipes go throughout the entire bathroom, which of course they usually would. Now the electrical circuits coming in, as in the lighting and the shower, also need to be connected together, or at least the uh, protective conductors do. And this can easily be done in the actual light fixture itself, so you would have a wire from here inside the uh, connection point of the light, and you would take that over to the shower's connection, and say make a connection inside the casing of the shower. And of course it's generally ideal to put these in before things like showers are fitted and walls are tiled, Otherwise you're uh, stuck with the uh, green and yellow wiring tacked all over the surface. 
So those two, of course, uh, will need to be connected together. And those themselves then need to be connected to the extraneous conductive parts, which in this case will be the hot and cold pipes. Now if you've got a shower there, the easiest way to do this is to do it inside the shower itself. Bear in mind you've got that cold pipe already coming in. So it's simply a matter of connecting from in here onto the cold pipe. And then notice by doing this you've not only connected to the cold here, but because you've got this link over here, then you've actually also connected onto the hot as well. So in the terms of this particular room, that's it finished. They're all now connected together, so in the end, any kind of fault, all of these things will stay at pretty much the same potential. Now, of course, that's not the only way to do it. Uh, it doesn't have to be done that way, but certainly that's a convenient method. If you didn't connect it inside here, for example, say that was a uh, plastic section, then you would need another wire from, say, here. You can take it out into the airing cupboard and then connect onto the pipes outside there. And in that case, again, you wouldn't need it under the uh, basin there because, of course, it's now connected outside. So there's always various options of doing it. But the key thing to make sure is that all of the parts are connected together somewhere. And then, of course, you can confirm that easily by measuring the resistance between the say, various pipes and the uh, earth terminal in the light fitting and the earth connection in the shower as well. And the final point here is that uh, any of these connections need to be remaining accessible. So, of course, this is fine. It's just inside the covering of the shower, so that's easily uh, got out for inspection or testing. Same within the light fitting. And if you put these in the airing cupboard, again, that's fine because, of course, you can uh, get to those easily. What you don't want to be doing is putting them under the bath like this, and then having one of those sort of baths that's all totally uh, concealed and uh, boxed in right down to the floor. So, of course, then the only way you're going to confirm that it's in there is to start ripping the panels off and uh, destroying the place. So that's not a good place if the bath is going to be one of these enclosed varieties. Under the basin is quite handy because normally you can hide it right up under the back where you can't actually see it. But again, if one of these basins that was, say, built into a uh, sort of vanity unit with sort of cupboards and all things across the front, then obviously that's not a good place because chiefly that's not going to be accessible. So again, outside in the airing you know, cupboard would be a suitable place. However, on a new installation, bearing in mind that most of this is probably not going to be needed, provided you've got an RCE that covers the circuits that are coming into the bathroom and there are no uh, other parts that are not effectively connected to the means of earthing. Now I'll just conclude this video by having a look at the minimum size you need for various supplementary bonding conductors. And uh, this is in the main regulations as well, but uh, what we've got here is the same information in a table because the regulation 5442 in the main regulations is actually five paragraphs of text, which of course is a bit uh, tedious to chew through. So this is the same information, but just in this smaller on-site guide, that's the spiral bound one. So. We've got the uh, table here, and uh, there's essentially three parts to this. So have a look on the right-hand side of the table there, and you see that part is where you've got uh, an extraneous conductive part connected to another extraneous conductive part, and that will be, for example, the hot and cold pipes being connected together, as in the previous example. And if you look down the table there, you see that the size is actually the same, and it's uh, 2.5 square millimetres if it's mechanically protected, and 4 square millimetres if it isn't. So of course all the uh, rows there are the same. So uh, in most cases it's going to be the four square millimetres. That's just going to be where you have a single wire connecting between say the hot and cold pipes. And the uh, 2.5 would only apply if it was mechanically protected, so sort of in trunking or something similar. But in most cases it's just going to be the wire on its own. So four square millimetres, and that's by far the most common size. Now the other two uh, sections of the table, that's the uh, left part there and the centre, are where you've got an exposed conductive part connecting to an extraneous conductive part, or you've got two exposed conductive parts connected together. So if we look in the centre there, this is where you've got the two exposed conductive parts, and this will be connecting, say, the uh, lighting circuit and the uh, circuit for the shower, for example. And uh, in this case, it depends on the size of the protective conductor in those circuits, and that's the uh, column over on the far left there. Now in the example we had there of the lighting circuit and the electric shower, the lighting circuit is probably going to have a protective conductor of one square millimetre, so that's the most common size for those. And uh, the shower, let's say it was wired in uh, twin and earth uh, flat cable with uh, 10 square millimetre line and neutral conductors. But notice that's the line and neutrals, the protective conductor is generally uh, smaller than that, 
and uh, for a 10 square millimetre line and neutral cable it's generally going to be a size of 4 square millimetres. So if you look across the table there you'll see that the minimum size in both cases, whether it's mechanically protected or not, is again that 4 square millimetres. So in that case we just need a piece of uh, wire of 4 square millimetres between the lighting circuit and the shower circuit. And if you look further down there, you'll see that the size obviously does increase if the uh, protective conductor in one or more of the circuits is larger. But uh, certainly in domestic properties, protective conductors over 4 square millimetres are fairly unusual. And the left side of the table, a very similar arrangement. That's where you have an exposed conductive part connecting to an extraneous one. So that might be say, from the lighting circuit to the hot and cold pipes. And the similar thing applies. It's the size of the protective conductor in the circuit and that determines the minimum size of the supplementary bonding conductor. So where you're just using a single uh, piece of wire, sort of green and yellow insulated, that's not mechanically protected, in most circumstances it's going to be 4 square millimetres is required, occasionally a larger size, but that's only going to be applicable if uh, one or more of the circuits going into the bathroom has a very large protective conductor in it, and so that's in the order of 6, 10 or 16. Certainly those are very uncommon in a domestic property. Now note for the left and centre there, if you've got the mechanical protection for the bonding conductor then the minimum size is considerably less and can actually be down to as small as one square millimetre. And this is why things like towel rails and say motion heaters and other similar things almost always don't need extra supplementary bonding because they're all going to have a protective conductor going to them and as you can see there in the majority of cases that's already of suitable size. So for example, the towel rail might be, say, wired in uh, 1.5 square millimetre cable, and you'll see the minimum size there is uh, either 1 square millimetre if it's connecting to an extraneous conductive part, or 1.5 if it's connecting to another exposed conductive part. So, of course, it's already having 1.5 in there, so and it's already in place. You don't have to add extra green and yellow wires to that. And if you look down the table, you see the size increases uh, exactly in line with the size of the protective conductor. So provided that the protective conductor is connected, and of course that's a requirement anyway, then no additional bonding is needed because that conductor can also be used as the supplementary bonding conductor. So let's look at supplementary equipotential bonding, and more specifically that involving bathrooms, which is the most common place you'll find it, certainly in domestic properties. But the principles are the same really wherever, and it's also needed in other situations such as swimming pools and uh, hot tubs and the like that uh, not everybody has those in their house. But certainly in commercial and industrial installations there are various circumstances where this type of bonding is required. But the idea is the same, it's just ensuring that in the event of a fault the voltage between any exposed and extraneous conductive parts is kept to an absolute minimum to avoid the risk of people getting a shock. And in the case of the bathroom uh, it's generally not needed these days as uh, normally it will be having an RCD on all the circuits and those other conditions will be met. So on new installations, generally not required. But of course it's still fairly common on older installations if you want to say change the light or add something else in there. And it's likely you'll find that the lighting is not on an RCD as it was not required to be until fairly recently. So in those circumstances you would need to check that it's installed. And of course uh, install some if it's not already there. And again it's easy to check, just uh, measure the resistance between the say, pipes and the uh, protective conductors and make sure that's below the required level which, as we saw in that equation, can vary depending on the type of device you have. Although, of course, in reality it's going to be in the sort of sub-1 ohm range if it's uh, in the uh, range as we've got here. So a uh, fairly uh, short look there at that, and there's got a lot more to this, so maybe do some videos on this in the future. But until then, thanks for watching.